Thank you for tuning in to Dream City Omaha Online. We hope you like this message and that it has an impact on your life. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. Hey, fellas, that's this Saturday. I know the... Is it next Saturday? Is it this Saturday? How do you say it? It's this coming Saturday, which is crazy that this coming Saturday is already July 2nd. Like, I, don't know how, I don't know how that happens. It seems like from, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, we're in like this, this time vortex where time moves at like one and a half times speed. And then from Thanksgiving through like the, the middle of March, it's like half speed, and it goes so slow through spring, and then it goes th- so fast through summer. But that's this Saturday. I want to encourage all the, the fellas to come on out this Saturday. We're going to be continuing our, uh, our discussion, our talk on redeeming manhood and, and biblical masculinity, what it means to be a man, not according to the world standards, not according to what our friends say or according to social media, but according to God's word, what does it mean to be a man? So that's this Saturday. I want to encourage you to come out. And then our discipleship term starts July 15th. That second Wednesday in July, I want to make mention of that as well. All of that's online. It's on the events page. So you can get on there, sign up for, uh, for classes for the discipleship term. This morning, I do have, uh, I have the privilege of bringing God's word, and I will here in just a moment. I want to, want to thank Pastor Doby for filling in last week on Father's Day. Hopefully, all the dads had a good Father's Day. Pastor Doby po- spoke and... and Talked about living a life that matters, living a life that counts, and, and how many of you enjoyed his word last week going through Ecclesiastes and the writings of King Solomon? Did a great job. Got a, a message from the Lord today. Before I get into that, I do have a, uh, a statement that I've prepared, and when, when I read from a piece of paper, you know that it's official. And I, I want to, before I start, I want to, to let you know this is not my letter of resignation. So, like some of you, I know some of you are having flashbacks to 15 years ago. Don't worry, it's okay. Uh, this is not my resignation, but I did prepare a statement, and I want to read it for you. Uh, I thought, do I do I write it? Do I do I just share from the heart? And so I decided to put my heart on paper because I wanted to make sure that I communicated uh, exactly what I wanted to say and what the Holy Spirit was putting in my heart to say. So, here we go. Are you ready? Some of you have no idea what I'm going to talk about, but we're gonna we're gonna share it. If you've been around Dream City, you know my stance on politics. I will never place politics above his kingdom because I'm a citizen of heaven before I'm a citizen of the United States. And my job is to make disciples of Jesus, not disciples of a political party. As Christians, we need to live according to kingdom principles first and foremost. And as citizens of this country... I do believe that it's our civic duty to participate in our constitutional republic to ensure that our values and our voices can be heard. But our civic duty should never come before our duty as followers of Jesus, and our commitment to a political ideology should never supersede our commitment to God's word. With that said, I do want to address the decision this week by the Supreme Court in overturning Roe v. Wade. I want to speak to this not as a man, not as a father, not as a member of any political party, not as an American citizen, but as a follower of Jesus. My heart rejoices for the countless innocent lives known by God, formed by him in their mother's womb, and created in his image that will have a chance to reflect God's glory through their lives. There are many political issues that we have remained neutral on, But the sanctity of life will never be one of those issues because it's not a political issue, but a kingdom issue. Every human life is valuable. And as a follower of Jesus, today we should be thankful. I will say it again unapologetically, this was a major victory, not for a political party, but for kingdom principles. Yet maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching online. And maybe you feel like Many women in our community and many women across our country, and rather than feeling like this was a win, you feel like this is a step backwards. I want you to know that we hear you, and more importantly, we're here for you. Maybe you're here or you're watching, and you've had an abortion. 
Maybe you felt shame. Maybe you felt condemnation from the enemy, from yourself, from others, maybe even from the church. Let me first apologize. And I want you to know that none of us are righteous on our own. And it's only through the righteousness of Christ. Can my sin and yours be covered under the blood of Jesus? How we respond as Christians moving forward is important. The Bible says that Jesus had compassion on the crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he stopped and he fed them, he healed them, he comforted them. And as as his disciples, may we move towards those who are hurting with love and compassion. The unfortunate fact is that even though the law might have changed, hearts have not. You can't legislate heart change. That only comes through an encounter with Jesus. If we want to experience real change in our country, not just as it pertains to this issue, but the many issues that are plaguing and dividing us, may we seek to do it first and foremost by committing ourselves and our lives to introducing as many people as we can to a God that loves them and a Savior that died for them. This is a time for celebration, but it is not a time to gloat neither in person nor online, or online. Paul told the Corinthians, let everything you do be done in love. May we, like Jesus, be filled with compassion, a compassion that causes us to act, a compassion that says, let the little children come unto me, a compassion that leads to a conversation at the well with a Samaritan woman, Compassion that stops in the busyness and calls out daughter to the woman with the issue of blood. A compassion that caused him to step out of heaven for your sake, for my sake, and for the sake of the many in our nation who are lost and hurting today. And that's all I have to say about that. Lord, we thank you. Lord, today we celebrate again, not not even as Americans, not as members of any party or in accordance with a political ideology. But Lord, we celebrate as citizens of heaven, as sons and daughters of the Most High. Lord, today we, we rejoice with those who rejoice. But God, I pray that we would also be moved with compassion, that we would also be be moved to act when action is needed and required. Lord, we pray for our leaders. We pray for President Biden. We pray for Vice President Harris. We pray for our Congress. We pray for the Supreme Court. We pray for our governor, our mayor, our state legislature. God, we, we pray that you would give them wisdom. God, I pray that you would surround them with godly people, with godly influence. Lord, as we, as we seek to first be citizens of heaven and second, Americans, Lord, I pray that the latter would not supersede the first, that we would keep the main thing the main thing, and that is being a reflection of your heart, your love, your character in our world, shining your glory for others to see. God, that is the church, this would be an opportunity for us not to to revel in our victory, but instead to be the city on a hill that can't be hidden, the light that shines, light that shines for others to see. God, I pray for those that are hurting today. I pray for those that are feeling shame and condemnation today. I feel, I, I pray for those that are confused today. Lord, wherever they find themselves, I pray that you would invade their space just as we sang this morning, that you would invade ours. Reveal yourself to them, your love for them, your plan for their lives. God, give us grace that we would walk in humility, doing everything in love, showing compassion on those around us just as you had compassion for us. We love you. We need you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready to go home? <laughs> this, this morning, uh, 
want to talk to you from, from Second Chronicles. We've been going through the Bible chronologically. Many of you know that if you're here joining us maybe for the first time or maybe you're joining us online for the first time. We've been reading through the Bible chronologically, started in, in January with Genesis. We will, we will conclude in Revelation at the end of the year and uh, we're almost halfway through. Those of you that have been, have been faithful with the Bible reading plan, I, I, I want to tell you, you're halfway there. We're halfway there. The end of June will be, will be the midpoint, obviously, of the year, but the midpoint of our Bible reading plan as well. A couple more, couple more months and we're going to get to Jesus. Just hang in there, Jesus. We will celebrate Christmas like the first week of October this year because that's when we'll get to the New Testament and our Bible reading plan. Jesus is coming. I, I just hang on, hang in there. The Messiah is on his way. And so we're going to get there, but we've been reading through the Old Testament. We've been, we've been looking at the story of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, how that God came to Abraham way back in Genesis, and he told Abraham, Abraham, I'm, I'm entering into a covenant with you. I'm making a covenant with you, and through you, the entire world is going to be blessed. I'm going to make you into a great nation, and it's going to be my people, and I will be your God. And we've seen the, the story of this nation, of this group of people who went into Egypt and lived in captivity as slaves for 400 years, only for God to show up and deliver them, led them through the desert, led them into the land that he had promised to Abraham to give his descendants. And now they're in the land and they, they, they've uh, established kingship for themselves because they wanted to be like the nations around them. So Saul was the first king. David was the second king. And we, we read for about two months the life of King David, the greatest king in Israel's history. And, and we just got done reading about his son, Solomon. Solomon, who the Bible referred to as the wisest man that ever lived, the richest man that ever lived. And we've read his, his writings. We, we read through the book of Proverbs. We read through Ecclesiastes. And, and, and today, as we, we continue this story, we see that Solomon is now dead. And Solomon's story is kind of a tragic one. It's a story of someone who had everything going for them and started out so well but stumbled across the finish line. And I think Solomon's story is a warning to us and a reminder that it's not so much how you start your race, but it's how you finish. Have you ever started something that you didn't finish? Come on. Any fellas, you ever start a project around the house that you didn't finish? Has your wife ever started a project that you had to finish? <laughs> Anybody empathize with me on that one? We, we start things and, and we, we sometimes cannot finish. And the, the tragedy of Solomon's life is that he started so well. We're first introduced to him asking God for wisdom. God says, ask me for anything and it's yours. And he says, I just want to be wise because I want to rule over your people with justice. And, and I want to be able to do it with wisdom. But I know that I'm just like a little child and I need you. And God says, I'll grant it to you. Not only will I give you what you've asked for, but I'll give you what you didn't ask for. And so he started out so well, and we, we, we read how he was so blessed and so, so favored by God. And, and to, the fact, to, to the point where, where kings from all around the world would come and sit at Solomon's feet just to glean from him and just to, to learn from him and hear his wisdom. And they would walk away amazed and astonished, sending gifts and gold and lumber and all these things. And we, we read that this week. But we also read how that Solomon took for himself 700 wives. Listen, I got one. And one's about all I can handle. And there's times where I can't even handle that without the grace of God. Hello. Not for you because of me. He has 700 wives from all over. And, and when God led them into the promised land, what did he tell them? He said, don't marry women from, from other nations. Don't do that because they will turn your heart away from me, is what he said. So Solomon takes for himself 700 wives from these different nations. And we read in the scriptures that those wives turned his hearts away from God. And to please his wives rather than please God, what he did is he established temples to these false gods. He established worship places to, to these pagan gods. 
God was very displeased with that. So God comes to Solomon at the end of his life and he says, Solomon, you had the recipe for success. You had it all. If you would have just kept your eyes on me and remained obedient to me, my promise to David and my promise to you was that one of, one of your sons would sit on the throne of Israel forever. He says, but because of your disobedience and because of what you've done and because you've allowed your wives to turn your heart away from me, I'm going to, to rip the kingdom away from you. He says, but because of your father, David, what I promise to do is, is I, will let your, I will let your lineage and, and your descendants continue to rule over one tribe. I'll give you one tribe, but I'm giving the rest, I'm giving the other 10 to one of your servants. I'm ripping the kingdom out of your hand to give it to somebody else. And Solomon stumbles across the finish line. And this week in our reading, there were so many different lessons to be learned. Like really, we could have taken this week's reading and done like a two-month series just on that. You look at the, the establishment of the northern kingdom. The, the kingdom is now divided. It's the, the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel in the north, and the kingdom of Judah in the south. And David and his descendants will continue to rule over Judah while, while Israel is, deals with infighting from here on out. And as you read and as we continue in our Bible reading plan, what we will find is that the kings in Judah in the south, for the most part, they will do what is right in God's sight. For the most part, they'll, they'll follow God's ways. They'll follow his commands. There, there will be slip-ups from time to time, as there are in, in all of our lives. But for the most part, they will keep their eyes on God. What's interesting is the northern kingdom, from the moment that it's established, is constantly in rebellion. It's constantly plagued by evil kings who are doing evil things in the sight of God. And they pay, they pay the price for that. What's interesting to me is this kingdom was established out of rebellion and out of the, the root of rebellion, rebellion continued in the kingdom of Israel from that time on. And what that tells us is how you end one season and enter into another is very important. How you enter into a season of life is important. Some of you are ending seasons. And you're entering into new seasons, new seasons of employment. Maybe, maybe you're packing up and you're moving, you're going somewhere, and, and new seasons in relationships. How you begin that season is determined by how you end the previous. And if you leave the previous season with bitterness, you'll enter into the next season sowing bitterness, reaping bitterness. If you enter in with unforgiveness, you will reap unforgiveness. Whatever you take with you is what you will plant in this new season of your life. We saw how that Solomon had, in his wealth, he had, he had his craftsmen build 500 shields made of pure gold. 300 of these shields weighed 15 pounds. 200 of these shields weighed 4 pounds. That's a lot of gold. He had them build these shields not for any military purpose, not, not to protect anything, simply as decoration. If that gives you any idea into how much Solomon had. He builds 500 shields made of pure gold and just lines the wall. Imagine, imagine that was your house. You're trying to figure out what picture to hang on the wall. How about that 15 pound shield of pure gold along with 499 others just like it? And these shields were, were not meant to be, to be prideful of Solomon, but they were a, re a reflection of God's favor that was upon his life. And the reason that there was favor upon his life and upon the kingdom is because they were in right relationship with God. And as they're in relationship with God, God blesses them. And out of that blessing, Solomon decides to build these. Well, one day, Solomon's son takes over. He abandons God. He turns from, from God's commands and Egypt invades. An army from Egypt comes and, and as they invade, they, they take everything back including the 500 shields. So what does Solomon's son do? He has his craftsmen build new shields. But they're not shields made of pure gold. They're shields made of bronze. As if to cover up the shame of what had happened. As if to cover up the mistakes of his past. And 
I read that and it's like, God, how many of us are walking around with a cheap imitation? How many of us come into church and we, we might sing a couple songs and we might put on the, the good face so that people think that we have it all together, but it's just a cheap imitation because inside we're nothing. We have nothing. Yet you've called us to walk in righteousness and you've called us to walk in favor and you've, you've ordained that for us if we would just be in relationship with you and yet, God, out of our own rebellion, we are putting on cheap imitations rather than walking in the fullness of the abundant life that you have called us to. So many, so many lessons to be learned as we read this week, but, but I want to focus on King David's great-great-grandson, Solomon's great-grandson, a man by the name of Asa. Now, Asa's story is found in, in 2 Chronicles. We also read about it in 1 Kings because we're kind of reading them both because they kind of parallel each other, give us the history of the nation. Uh, but, but I want to read from, from 2 Chronicles. In, in Asa's life, like his, his great-grandfather, like his grandfather, like his father was was marked by seasons of success and seasons of failure. And this morning, for, for our time together, I want to talk to you about the difference between success and failure. The keys to, to living in success rather than ending up like Solomon and stumbling across the finish line of life. Because sometimes, sometimes the difference between success and failure is so razor thin. Sometimes it just comes down to one decision. Sometimes it comes down to one choice. All you have to do is ask a Husker fan what the difference is between success and failure, right? How many Husker fans, Husker football fans? All right. If you're not, we'll pray for you at the end of the service and we'll believe that God can work in your heart. How many of you Husker fans remember what our, se- our, our record was last season? You tried to forget it, I know. Three wins, nine losses. One of the worst seasons, according to our record, that we can remember for a very long time. But of the nine losses that we had, do you know what what the average margin of defeat was? In nine losses throughout our season, we lost by an average of six points. One possession, one play. Michigan State, it was one punt in the wrong direction. Michigan, it was one fumble late at the, game, at the end of the game. So many things. If you ask Scott Frost, Coach Frost, what's the difference between success and failure? He will say, it's about this much. It's not, it's not a lot. And sometimes in our lives, we, we need to understand that. The importance of every decision that we make, because the difference between success and failure is sometimes just this. It's just one attitude. It's just one habit. It's just one action. It's just one thought. It's just one, it's one interaction, one encounter. Before we get into understanding how we find success, I think it's important that we define success. I think the reason why so many people struggle with finding success in life is because they haven't defined what success looks like for them. According to the world, success might look like having the biggest bank account. It might look like having the biggest house, having the nicest car, going to the best schools, having the most followers on social media. There are different things that define success for different people according to their values and according to their standards. But for you and I, as followers of Jesus, there is only one set of values and there is only one standard, and that is God's word. So when it comes down to understanding what makes our lives successful, my definition of success in my life is fulfilling God's purpose for me. If I can fulfill God's purpose in my life, I will be successful. His purpose in me as a husband, his purpose in me as a father, excuse me, as a pastor in every area of my life. If I, if I can fulfill God's purpose, then I know that it was successful. This morning, as we talk about the difference between success and failure, 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 1, 
It says this, when Abijah died, this is Asa's dad, he was buried in the city of David. Then his son Asa became the next king. Now, after Asa became king, the Bible says that there was peace in the land for 10 years. Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the pagan shrines. He smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded the people of Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his law and his commands. Also, also removed the pagan shrines as well as the incense altars from every one of Judah's towns. So Asa's kingdom enjoyed a period of peace. During those peaceful years, he was able to build up the fortified towns throughout Judah, and no one tried to make war against him at this time, for the Lord was giving him rest from his enemies. Lord, we thank you for your word today. God, you have called us to be victors in all things. We know that according to your word, we are more than conquerors, not because of ourselves, but it's only through Christ Jesus. Lord, today as we examine your word, as we study your word, I pray that your word would come alive to, alive to us, alive in our minds, alive in our hearts, alive in our spirits. God, as we seek to, to live lives of success, to live lives that don't just start out well, but, but are strong in the middle and strong at the end of our race, God, I pray that today through your word, you would give us questions to ask ourselves and tools to put in our tool belt, that we would keep our eyes focused on you as we seek to run the race that you have called us to run. We love you. We thank you. pray that you would anoint these words and anoint our ears today. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, as we, we read about the, the beginning of Asa's reign, just in those few short verses, I mean, we could stop there. Talk about how that God gave him rest. How many of you want rest in your life? How many of you are due for a season of rest? You're like, all, all of us, man, we're, we're due for some rest. But what's interesting is when that rest came, what did Asa do? He didn't kick his feet up. He didn't sit down in his comfy chair. He went to work. He went to work fortifying the towns in his, in his country, in his region. See, sometimes I think when we enter into those seasons of rest, we're like, all right, thanks, God. Now I don't have to do anything. God's like, no, this is when we prepare ourselves for the next season that we're entering into. So many things we could, we could look at what, what caused him to, to experience this rest as he went throughout the entire region and tore down all of the shrines and all of the temples and all of the altars and all of the places of worship, all of the places that his, his great-grandfather had established, all of the places that his grandfather and his father before him let stay in the land. This man came and says, no, this isn't right. We need to tear them down. And it's time for us as a people to get back to seeking the Lord. There was revival in Asa's day. We want revival, but we don't want to get rid of the altars that we've established in our hearts. For how long have we as the church in America prayed for revival while continuing to worship false gods in our own hearts? So much in this text, and I haven't even gotten to my notes yet. As we look at the, the life of this man, three, three things, three keys, three questions that, that I want you to ask yourself as, as we sit here today and have this conversation and as you leave and you allow the Holy Spirit to continue to minister to you. Three questions. And the, the first one is this. If we're going to live lives that are successful, we have to ask where our worship is directed. What are you worshiping, essentially, is the question. Because this is one of those one of those things that will set the course of your life. If you want to be successful, then you have to be careful of the things that you worship. What, is, what does it mean to worship? It means to give yourself to. It means to honor. It means to value. What is the, the number one thing in your life? At Dream City, our, our, number, our number one value is God first. In everything, in everything that we do, in every worship set that we, that we do, in every message that we preach, in every small group, in every class, every week, everything that we do, God has to come first. Because if, if God's not first, then we're here for nothing. 
What did Asa do? He tore down the shrines, right? That's what, that's what we just read. Go and put that scripture up there. He removed the altars. He removed the shrines. He smashed the pillars. He cut down the poles. And then he brought their hearts. He commanded them to come back to the Lord. He said, it's time for us to redirect our worship. And it's time for us in the church to redirect our worship too. Now, I understand that, that from the hours of 9 to 10.30 on Sunday mornings, we are very good about what we worship and who we worship and where our, our worship is directed. But then what happens the rest of the week? We go home and we take God off the altar of our life, off the throne of our heart, and we place other things. And we say, well, I've worshiped God now. Now it's time for me to worship my job or to worship my boyfriend or my girlfriend or to worship money or to worship sports or to worship achievement or to worship my schooling or to worship. I have to give myself to all of these other things. And we take God off the throne of our hearts. We place him aside and we say, next Sunday, don't worry. I'll come back and I'll put you back. But if we want to live lives that are successful rather than lives of failure, we have to we have to evaluate where our worship is directed. Second Chronicles chapter 15, which is the, the next chapter, says this. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah. He went out to meet King Asa and as, he was, as he was returning from the battle. Now, at this point, what has happened is, is Asa has been given this period of rest, but an army from Ethiopia comes and attacks Judah. And it's not just any army. The Bible says this is an army of a million soldiers, a million men are in this army. They have 300 chariots, which in that day were essentially tanks. A million men, 300 tanks, they came and attacked. And what does Asa do? He calls out to God and say, says, says, God, we're nothing against this army. And God rescues them and God delivers them. God gives them the victory. So on his way home from, from the battle, this man comes out to meet him. And he says, listen to me, Asa. Listen, all you people of Judah and Benjamin, the Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever you seek him, you will find him. But here's the caution and here's the warning. If you abandon him, he will abandon you. We see this warning given time and time and time again. We saw it given to Moses. We saw it given to Joshua. We saw it given to David. We saw it given to Solomon. We've seen it given to the kings. Now, if you're obedient and if you stay with me, I will be your God and I will give you victory and I will give you provision and I will be what you need me to be when you need me to be it. But if you turn your back on me, I have no choice but to remove my hand of favor from off of you. And when you come back to me, I'll reestablish my favor on your life. And when you turn from me, that's the story of the book of Judges. It's the cycle of on again, off again, on again, off again, on again, off again, obedience, disobedience. Here we see, we see Asa trusting in God and God coming in him. He, he's promising him, I will stay with you as long as you stay with me. As long as you keep your eyes upon me, Hebrews 12 tells us, let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us. And he asks the question, how do we do that? He answers his own question by keeping our eyes on Jesus, by worshiping him, by remaining in communion with him. Listen, as a husband, I can't be successful unless my eyes are on Jesus. When I take my eyes off Jesus, I fail miserably. My wife would tell you, maybe. But love keeps no record of wrongs, so she hopefully wouldn't be able to. As a father, unless I keep my eyes on Jesus, I fail miserably. I respond out of frustration, and I respond out of anger, and I... I get selfish, and rather than spending time and investing in them, it's about what I can do for me. As a pastor, if I don't keep my eyes on Jesus, I fail. In every area, sir, ma'am, young person in your life, if you want to be successful, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. And if you stay with him, he'll stay with you. And if you seek him, you're going to find him. 
But if you turn your back on him, he has no choice but to remove his favor from off of your life. We have to evaluate where our worship is directed. The second thing we have to ask ourselves is who do we, who do we surround ourselves with? Who are the people that have influence in our lives? Show me the five people that you spend the most time with and I'll show you who you'll become. Is Jesus one of the people you spend the majority of your time with? Are good spiritual influences people that you spend the majority of your time with? Who are you surrounding yourself with? I, I love this part in the story. It goes on to say that King Asa even deposed his grandmother. Now, it's, you know it's serious. Grandma, we need to have a conversation. He deposed her as her position as, from her position as queen mother because she had made an obscene Asherah pole. This is a place of worship for a false god. He cut down the pole, he broke it up, and he burned it in the Kidron Valley. Even his own grandmama, he said, listen, we can't be doing this. I know you're living in the palace, and I know things have been going well for you, but this can't continue because this is not the way that God has called us to live. He wasn't afraid of ending relationships that needed to be ended. He wasn't afraid of cutting ties when it called for that. If there are people in your life that are leading you in any direction other than into God's purpose for your life, you need to either, one, limit the amount of time you spend with them, limit the influence that they have in your life, or two, cut it off altogether. We have to be careful of the people that we surround ourselves with. 1 Corinthians 15 says, bad company corrects good, corrupts good character. You ever been guilty by association? Wrong place, wrong time? I didn't do it. It doesn't matter. You were there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I remember in high school, it was lunch. I was in the bathroom, and as I was leaving the bathroom, there was, there was three of my friends that were with me, and we were all walking out together, and as, as we were walking out, the principal was walking in. The principal walked in, and he went into one of the stalls, and as we walked out, I walked out first. I didn't see anything, but one of my friends had turned the lights off. I could tell you the name of the person, but I'm not going to. But we walked out, and he turned the lights off, and in about five minutes later, the principal comes out of the bathroom. He comes into the, the cafeteria, and he says, you, 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 and you, my office now. Like, I didn't even do anything. I got up, went down there, and he's like, which one did it? I said, I don't know. Who was the one that did it? I don't know. He says, well, since nobody's going to tell me who did it, you all have in-school suspension. I know. It was the one time I ever got in trouble in school. Yeah. <laughs> He said, you're all in trouble if, if, if nobody's going to tell me. Listen, I didn't do anything, but because of the people that I was with, they brought me down. I got in trouble the same way that they did. And it's the same in your life. It might not even be you. You might have good intentions. You might be trying to run your race and live your life and keep your eyes upon God. But the people that you're surrounding yourself with are taking your eyes off of him and trying to put them on all of these other things that you're not meant to be putting your eyes on. And you find yourself worshiping all of these false gods with other things sitting on the throne of your life, wondering how you got there. It's because of the people that you've allowed to influence you. You need to evaluate who do you, who do you allow to speak into your life? Who do you surround yourself with? And then third, the, the third thing. Where do you place your trust? What do you trust in? When times are hard, what do you turn to? When money is short, what do you go to? Kids are acting crazy. Who do you call on? When stuff at work is hard, what do, you, what do you find comfort in? Where is your trust directed? What are you trusting in? See, Asa started off great. David started off great. Solomon started off great. So many men started off great. Trusted in God, called upon him when the Ethiopians came. God rescued them. Trusted in God. The man comes out. He says, listen, if you keep your eyes on God, he'll, he'll stay with you. Trust, trust, trust. But he got to a point where 
He's experienced peace for like 25 years in his, his kingdom now. Nobody's dared to attack him. He's gotten comfortable. He's gotten complacent. He's gotten a little bit of prideful. He says, listen, I've done it. I could do it again. It's, it's fine. We're good. All of a sudden, Israel mounts an army and Israel comes to, to attack. And we, we see this played out in the story as well. The 36th year of his reign, King Basha of Israel invades Judah to prevent anyone from entering or leaving Judah's territory, the kingdom of Judah. Verse two, Asa responded. How did he respond the first time? By seeking God. This time he responds by going to the bank. He removes the silver and the gold from the treasury of the temple and from the royal palace. So he goes and he empties his bank account, essentially. He sends it to the king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus with this message. Let there be a treaty between you and me, like between your father and my father. I'm sending you silver, gold. Break your treaty with Israel and start a new treaty with me. See, the first time his trust was in God. This time his trust was in his resources. The first time his trust was in God. This time his trust is in this king of a foreign nation. He goes to the bank, takes out everything he has, brings it to him as a, as a bribe, as an offer, and says, hey, break your treaty with them. Start a treaty with me. Stop fighting against me, but start fighting against him. And the king, who just got all this money, said, okay. So he, so he does. Fights against this other king, but the story doesn't end there. Verse 7 says, at that time, Hanani the seer came to King Asa and he told him, because you have put your trust in the king of Aram instead of in the Lord your God, you missed your chance. Whew. You missed your chance. Listen to me. I don't want you to miss your chance because your trust is misplaced. I don't want you to miss the, the opportunities that God has for you because your eyes are on other things. You missed your chance to destroy the army, the king of Aram. Don't you remember what happened when the Ethiopians, the Libyans, and their vast army with all their chariots and charioteers? Don't you remember what happened? You relied on the Lord. He handed them over to you. The eyes of the Lord searched the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a fool you have been. What a fool you've been. You've experienced peace and you could have remained in peace and there could have continued to be peace in your kingdom. But now, because you've misplaced your trust, you will be at war constantly. What do you trust? Who do you trust? He trusted in men rather than trusting in God. He trusted his resources rather than trusting God, he trusted in his own thinking. He trusted in his own plans. He trusted in all of these other things. And we can sit here today and say, Asa, what were you thinking? And it's so obvious, why would you do that? But how many times do we in our lives when things get tough or we get a bad report from the doctor and things aren't going according to our plan and there's a, an enemy knocking on our doorstep, do we quickly put our trust in so many other things. What's really sad is, in a few verses, we read about the end of King Asa's life. This man who started out so well by destroying all of the pagan shrines and temples, this man who defeated, with God's help, the, the, the army of, of a million people, this man who experienced years and decades of peace in Judah, Gets to the end of his life, doesn't trust in God. He gets, he has a bad report from this man who comes and says, here's what God says. You're going to be at war. You could have had peace, but you missed your chance. And we see Asa at the end of his life. In the 39th year of his reign, he develops a foot disease. Yet even with the severity of his disease, he did not seek the Lord's help but turned only to his physicians. Even at the end of his life, and I don't know whether he did this out of bitterness, out of stubbornness, out of pride, 
out of ignorance. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know why in this situation he, he chose not to, to see God, but I think the Holy Spirit inspired the writer to include this for our benefit today. Because Paul says everything that happened in the Old Testament was, was there for an example. Everything that's written is there for an example for us today. And so I think it's, I think it's there for us to, to cause us to pause, to reflect, to question. Where do we place our trust? Is my trust in my knowledge and my understanding? Is my trust in human reasoning? Is my trust in my resources, or is my trust in God? See, at the end of the day, everything else is answered by this question. Because if you trust God, you'll love God. If you trust God, you'll obey God. If you trust God, you'll depend on God. If you trust God, you'll worship God. If you trust him, you'll spend as much time as you can with him. If you don't trust him, you won't. How do I develop trust if I don't, if I don't trust? You can't trust him if you don't know him. You can't know him if you don't spend time with him. You can't, you can't know him if you don't see his character and know his character You can't live the life that he's created you, he's destined you, and he's called you to live without making sure that your eyes are focused on him, your worship is directed towards him, and your trust is firmly placed in him. This morning, that's the difference. The difference between living a life where at the end of it all, we can say, you know what? There were ups and there were downs. There were good times and there were hard times. But at the end of my life, I want to look back knowing that that it was a success. That as a husband, I loved my wife every day. As a husband, I was faithful to her. As a father, my Kids grew up in the instruction of the Lord and they loved Jesus with all of their hearts. That defines success for me. As a pastor, I was faithful to the call of God upon my life and I led the best I could with his help, those that he had entrusted to me and faithfully taught his word. I was obedient when he called me and I stopped when he told me to stop. I moved when he told me to move. That's success for me. And I, might, I, might, I might leave this world with nothing in the bank. But if I can say those things, then I'll know that it was successful. And I might leave not with anything physical or material to show for it, but my reward is not here, but my reward is in heaven. I focus not on the things that I can see, but the things that are unseen. And if we want to live lives that at the end, we can say that they were successful. The the difference between success and failure is razor thin. Today, my encouragement, my challenge to you is to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into those things. To ask him and to ask yourself, is there any place in my heart any place in my life where my worship is directed at anything other than you? Is there anybody that I've given influence to that is leading me away from your plan for me? Is there any area that I'm trusting myself rather than trusting in you? This morning, if we want to live lives of success, may we live lives trusting in him. Amen. Stand with me this morning. Some of you have been waiting 45 minutes wondering when we were going to take communion. I would encourage you to take your emblems out now. We'll, we'll partake together before we leave today. If you came in and you didn't get communion elements, go ahead and just raise your hand. We've got some ushers and we've, 
be more than happy to serve you. This morning as we partake of communion, I, I think it's I think it's appropriate. As we read about the beginning of Asa's reign, first thing that he did was to remove the idols, to reestablish worship for God, to recommit not just himself and not just his household, but the entire nation, recommitting to God. And today as we partake of communion, I wanna give you an opportunity to do just that. If you know that there's something in your life that you need to repent of, if there's, there's sin, if there's, there's anything that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you about today or, or leading up to today that you need to confess and repent and seek forgiveness for, I wanna give you an opportunity to do that. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you can't be successful in life, true, truly successful without him. The Bible says, and we read it today, if you seek him, you'll find him. Today, if you call upon him, he'll answer you. If you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. Repent of your sins. Surrender your life to him. The promise is your name will be written in the book of life and there is an eternal hope for you to hold on to. As Jesus was in that upper room, the Bible says that he was with his disciples and he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And after he gave thanks, he told them, this is my body, which is broken for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And after dinner, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. It's blood which was shed for you. It's Blood, which means that we no longer have to come into the temple with sacrifices to, to be slaughtered, but because of his sacrifice, we can have relationship and be restored to the heart of the Father. This morning, God, we thank you. We thank you for your body, which was broken on our behalf. We thank you that your word says that by your stripes, we are healed. By your broken body, we can be made whole. And it's not just a, a physical healing. It's not just when I'm sick, I can stand on that and be healed. But, but God, in our sin and in our depravity, we were broken and we were lost and we were on our way to hell. But God, because of your sacrifice, we can be made whole. and We can be made new. Lord, we thank you for your blood, which was shed for the remission of sins. Lord, we thank you that today we can, we can stand before you righteous, not because of our righteousness, but because of Christ's righteousness. That everything that we've done in the past, good, bad, otherwise, is all washed under the blood. Lord, today we thank you for your body. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for the new covenant. We recommit our lives to you. As Asa, who took, took, took power, began his reign, he removed the idols, he restored worship. Lord, today we remove the idols from our hearts and we restore worship. So he wasn't afraid to cut off relationships. Lord, if there's any, any relationships that we need to, to walk away from or we need to minimize or we need to be careful of, would you... Give us the strength and the grace to walk in that. God, today we place our trust in you. Let's take the bread this morning and the cup. And Lord, as we go this week, I pray that you would give us opportunities to be distributors of your hope, of your love, of your mercy and of your grace. May we lead with compassion, a compassion that causes us to act in all things and at all times. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Love you guys. Have a great week.
Dream City Omaha, we're all about helping each other discover Christ, recover identity, and uncover purpose. We encourage you to explore our past sermon series and classes to help you find the abundant life in Christ. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for all our latest videos.